Uh, welcome to my microbiology presentation. In this presentation, I'll be covering the basics of spirochetes. So the learning objectives for this presentation are to describe the diseases caused by spirochetes and to understand the pathogenicity and epidemiology of the diseases. So to start off with, what are spirochetes? So spirochetes are gram-negative, motile and coiled bacteria, as we can see here in this picture here. These are very commonly found in aquatic environments and they are also commonly found in animals which will then get transmitted over to humans. So in terms of morphology, these there are a protoplasmic cylinder, as we can see here in this cylinder shape. And deep inside, they've got these called endoflagella, which are located between the outer sheath here and the cell wall, which is actually this bit here. So a few properties of spirochetes is they are thin, tightly cold, and helical, and they move like a corkscrew. So if you just look at the previous slide, we can see here that it literally does look like a champagne corkscrew. So you'd expect it to move like a corkscrew. And then also deep inside you've got something called an axial filament. This allows this rotation of the axial filaments is what allows it to propel itself forwards. And as a result of this, it's able to burrow through tissues like a drill. So the three general spirochetes we'll be looking at will be treponoma, or treponema pallidum pallidum. We'll be looking at Borrelia, so and the two we'll look at are Borrelia bugdaferi and Borrelia recurrentis. And then finally Leptospira, and we'll be looking at Leptospira interrogans. To start off with, we're going to look at Treponoma pallidum pallidum. Okay, it infects only humans, okay? So animals do not get infected with this, it's just, just only humans. It's the causative agent of syphilis. As we know, that syphilis is an STD. It's transmitted by sexual contact. And this is most commonly found amongst sexually active men and users of illegal drugs. So if someone's infected with this and they use a needle, and they then use that needle for another user, that user is then going to get infected, similar to how HIV is infected by needles. So in terms of virulence, it cannot be cultivated outside of a human host because it doesn't survive. And also, due to some DNA um, testing, we found out that they produce proteins which allow them to adhere to human cells. And also, they're able to produce an enzyme called hyaluronidase, complicated word, and that allows it to infiltrate intracellular spaces. So not conventional like drugs usage will be difficult. And to make things even worse for us, it contains some called glycolyx, which prevents us from doing phagocytosis on it. So all our macrophages and B lymphocytes, they can't touch these things because they can't or not physically cause phagocytosis. So and the disease that causes syphilis. So syphilis has four stages. We've got primary, secondary, latent and tertiary. But apart from this sexually transmitted terms of syphilis, we can also get congenital syphilis. This is when an infected mother who is infected with, who's got syphilis, can, it can transmit it to the fetus by the umbilical cord. As a result of this, that fetus can die, so you have a miscarriage, or if it, or if it is successfully born, it will have mental retardation and, and slash or malformation, so crippling disabilities. Okay, just to let you know, this red triangle here I'll have at the corner of my slides. This is a, this is a warning showing you that some pictures you'll see in these slides are quite disgusting, to put it just to put it politely. So if you are of a sensitive disposition, I recommend you watch away when I warn you. Okay. So the primary stage of syphilis is a localized infection, which is when you get something called chancre forming on the external genitalia. So warning, look away now. So this here is the male genitalia. As we can see here, this is what's called a chancre. So this is the primary thing to look out for. If you see chancre forming on your doodadies, you may have syphilis. Then the secondary stage of it is a skin rash. So again, look away for a sensitive. So this is similar to chicken pox, how it infects the whole of your body. This is the secondary stage of syphilis. So if you've got these on your doodadies and you've got this all over your body, you may have secondary syphilis. Then after this, you then get to a latent stage. This is a clinically inactive stage, so most cases of syphilis do not extend beyond this point, as we either fight off the bacteria or the antibiotics have successfully kicked in. However, in some cases, they can actually advance to a fourth stage called the tertiary stage. So here you get gumus forming, you get lesions, and possibly dementia, blindness, paralysis, and heart failure kicking in. Okay, so if you're sensitive, look away now. So here, just so you know, this is someone's forehead. And this here is a goomer. 
So it forms this massive pus and blood filled sac around the skin, which is incredibly sore and painful. So in terms of diagnosis, treatment and prevention, for diagnosis we can do an antibody test. And then, however, tertiary syphilis is really difficult to diagnose. Because in that tertiary stage there are not many pathogens inside the body. So you can take blood samples and it may come back negative, but there could still be some spirochetes in that blood somewhere. Then when it comes to treatment, the ideal drug we use is penicillin. However, this does not affect tertiary syphilis. Okay, it only works if you catch it early when it's in the primary or secondary stage. To prevent us from getting syphilis, the most obvious thing is sexual abstinence and safe sex. That way it won't spread from male to female or female to male, etc. And here's a few subspecies of treponin polymne you get. Okay, so again, here's that red triangle, so you may want, want to look away now. So treponin endomysium causes the disease bedule. Okay, so on the lip you get these um, swollen sores here. Another type you get is perchinue, which causes yours, which is here, so nasty sacs around the lips again. Then also you can get treponin polydum caritium, which causes pinta, which is a serious skin rash, which can get all over your body. Okay, now we're going to talk about Borrelia bugdaferi, okay, which is the main, which is the causative agent for Lyme disease. Okay, it's transmitted by ticks. So yeah, no pun intended. These little buggers right here, when they're infected and they bite you, they can transmit Lyme disease, and they can also transmit many other diseases. Right? So for Lyme disease, one of the main signs and symptoms you get is this: this red bullseye rash. How you, how you can notice it? It's literally like a bullseye with a red circle and the dartboard around it. You can also get some neurological symptoms and cardiac dysfunction as it advances to latent stages. But one of the most severe um, signs and symptoms is when you get severe arthritis, which can last for years. And the reason why it lasts for years is because you, you get such an overwhelming immune response that it literally cripples your own body. Okay, and over in the USA, where there's close contact with deers and humans, there is a higher rate of infection, as, the, as you'll understand if you look at the, um, the tick life cycle. So for diagnosis, treatment and prevention, the diagnosis is based on the signs and symptoms unique to the, to the disease. So as I showed you about the bullseye rash, that is unique to the, to the disease. So if you've got that, it's almost pretty certain you've got Lyme disease. For treatment, we can use two types of antibiotics. We can use doxycycline or penicillin. However, it, this only works for those first stages, as latent symptoms are caused by immune response. So when you start getting heart failure and your arthritis, that's because of, your, of the overwhelming immune response. It's got nothing to do with the actual bacteria itself. And the most obvious way to prevent it is to avoid ticks. So you can use like pet, um, insecticides to kill pet, um, ticks. And then next we're going to look at Borrelia recurrentis for relapsing fever. So as the name of the disease suggests, relapsing fever, it's a recurring fever or flu-like symptoms, which you're probably wondering, you don't say. Well, I do. So this here is a graph of, of a general amount of time when you've got recurring fever. So here is when you get your first signs and symptoms. So this um, fever is going to last for four days from day 8 to day 12. So your body temperature rapidly rises up to 41. You fight off the disease, and there you go, you know. Then all of a sudden you get another spike where it recurs and then it goes back down and so on and so forth. Obviously the amount of time you, you get these symptoms will decrease gradually over time because your body will be gradually building a stronger and stronger immune system or immune response to it. So in terms of diagnosis, treatment and prevention, if you look at a blood sample you've, and you see the presence of spirochetes, that's how you know it's probably going to be relapsing fever. For treatment, again we use doxycycline. For pregnant women and kids, erythromycin is something you need to be careful of. You might want to read up on that, it's quite interesting. And for prevention, again, avoid ticks and lice, so insecticides. Good personal hygiene can also be useful, and again, as I said, insect repellent. So, Leptospira interrogans, the causative agent for leptospirosis. So this enters through the skin or mucous membrane and it travels by the bloodstream. As it travels around the body, it can cause internal hemorrhaging, liver and kidney dysfunction, which eventually causes jaundice. 
So again, red triangle, look away now. So for those of you who don't know, jaundice is when your skin turns yellow and your eyes turn this dark yellow due to liver failure. So looking out for this is really important for looking out for leptospirosis. So in terms of diagnosis, treatment and prevention, again, observation of spirochetes in the blood. So if you see a spirochete, you can just treat it with penicillin as it suggests here. And to prevent it, you need to try and avoid con contact with contaminated animals and water. So you could be at risk if you're a farmer where you've got constant contact with animals and their water systems, okay? So just be aware, if you're a farmer, make sure you avoid that stuff, okay? So just a few points to consider. So make sure you make a database or a spreadsheet of diseases and their causative agents. When it comes to revising for exams, that will make things a heck of a lot easier. So when you're making this table, make sure you've got several columns. So for example, diagnosis, treatment, prevention, virulence factors, and so on and so forth. And it's also really useful to continuously add to this database and to revise the table every time you do so. So over a period of time, you can go from these four which I've labelled here, all the way up to maybe 40 different bacteria, or even more, depending on what your exams are going to be like. And if you want to look up some interesting data about like um, pandemics, endemics, or so on and so forth, try and find some data. So one of the organisations I recommend is the World Health Organisation. They always post up-to-date information on diseases, about distribution, and stuff like that. I highly recommend it. So now we're coming to the final section of the presentation, the test yourself bit. So just a multiple choice question just to get things started. Which of the following pathogens is the causative agent for yours? So Trepanoma pallidum pallidum, Trepanoma pallidum pertinum, Borrelia burgdorferi, Leptospira interrogans, Trepanoma pallidum caritium, or is it Borrelia recurrentis? Got a choice of those six. And again, this is the essay style question I want you to try and have an attempt at. So I want you to describe the disease caused transmission of disease, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention for the pathogen Trepanoma pallidum pallidum. And just know, for this bit, you can change it to any bacteria. It will be really good practice for those essay style questions. And for those of you who are struggling for essay style questions, I've got a video post on my channel about how to do those essay style questions. That would seriously help you with this essay in particular. So, as usual, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Make sure you drop a comment for feedback, and I'll see you next time. Peace.